welcome to today's seminar. Today's speaker is uh, Luke Postel from University of Waterloo. He will speak about how many colors can we save. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Bernard, and thanks for having me and letting me give this talk. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about how many colors can we save. We'll talk about that more, but if you like coloring, this is a talk for you. Uh, I should mention this will be if you are going to Fargo, I'll be giving a some, somewhat similar version, but uh, I'll try to do more in this talk and show you generalizations and things I won't have time to talk about. Uh, I should also mention this is joint work with uh, Mark Bonamy, who is my postdoc, who is now uh, in Bordeaux as a professor, Daki Chen, who is my master's student, and Thomas Perrette, who is a student of Karsten Thomason's and was visiting us last fall. So, part one, let me tell you about Reed's Chi Delta Omega results. You might know this, but first, the soft introduction. So you probably all know this, but a K coloring in a graph G is an assignment of colors 1 to K, such that adjacent vertices do not receive the same color. The chromatic number denoted Chi of G is the minimum number K, such that G has a K color. And, well, what do you know about the chromatic number? I want to pitch you that there are two trivial bounds on the chromatic number. One is the greedy upper bound, that the chromatic number is at most the maximum degree plus one. You take an ordering of the vertices and you color them greedily, and if you have this many colors, then you can always color it different than the neighbors. So that's a very standard upper bound, and it's useful in a lot of easy coloring proofs. But here's a nice question. Can we save any colors from this trivial upper bound? Well, no, because it's tight. It's tight uh, for complete graphs. Right? They have degree n minus 1, but need n colors. And also for odd cycles. Odd cycles have max degree 2, but need 3 colors. And Brooks' theorem says from 1941 that this is basically it. So if you assume you're connected, then the maximum degree is at most delta, unless you're complete, or an odd cycle. So maybe this isn't how you've normally seen kind of Brooks' theorem, but I want to pitch it to you as Brooks' theorem is saying we can save one color. It's, it's kind of that first result telling us Okay, we can save something unless these things happen. Well, this sets us up for maybe a, a very nice conjecture graph theory, but first let me tell you, well, how much can we try to save? Well, there's a trivial lower bound. The trivial lower bound is, I mean, the clique number. If I have a complete graph, I need that many colors just to color that clique. So we have this trivial lower and upper bound, and there's this really pretty conjecture from Reed from 1998. I think it's one of the kind of one of the most natural and nice conjectures, at least in chromatic graph theory. And what it says is that the chromatic number is actually at most delta plus 1 plus omega over 2. And I'm going to take the ceiling because this might be uh, a fraction. And so what is that saying? Well, it's saying somehow it's kind of at most halfway in between this upper and lower bound, but erring towards the lower bound of the clique number. And there's a nice alternate formulation, which will be useful uh, for some parts of the later talk. So let me pitch it like this, is that the, let's define the gap as delta plus 1 minus omega, and that'll denote the gap between the trivial upper and lower bounds. And then let's, talk, let's define save to be delta plus 1 minus chi. It's this amount of colors we'd like to save from the trivial upper bound. Then Reed's conjecture could be stated as that saved is at least gap over 2 full. So you can save at least half the gap. So we have this gap between the upper and lower bounds, and Reed's saying, well, we can save at least half of that. Right? So, I mean, Brooks' theorem tells us when we can save one, but this is saying somehow we can, we can save a lot. And actually, it's tight. So I should point out, Reed's conjecture is tight. And the example is uh, the blow-up of a five cycle. So what do I mean? You take a five cycle, and you blow up each vertex to a clique. And what happens in this graph? Well, let's think about it. What is the maximum degree? The maximum degree, you basically go to three of these blocks. So if they were of size k, you'd have 3k minus 1 as your maximum degree. What is the clique, though? A clique is two of the vertices. So the clique number is basically two-thirds of the maximum degree plus 1. Because the maximum degree is like 3k minus 1, so it's two-thirds of 3k. It's 2k. What about the chromatic number? Well, this is a little harder, but if you know fractional coloring, then the fractional chromatic number of C5 is 5 halves. If you don't know what that means, then let me say it like this. 
Well, what would you do? I claim the chromatic number is 5 6 delta plus 1, which works out to be 5 halves k. Why? So you use k colors here. You need another k here. But then with the remaining half, I can give kind of some of those colors and the new k over the last k over 2, some of the other, the last k over 2, and this will let me color the last k. So that's, that's basically fractional chromatic number. Point is, the takeaway is this is a type. So omega is 2 thirds, chi is 5 6, right? So then it's exactly halfway in between omega and delta plus 1. So it is tight. So that's nice. But what, so this was a really nice conjecture, but what is known? about the conjecture, and read in the same paper in 1998. At I mean, it's nice he made this conjecture, but he actually suggested there's some evidence that's true, and here's the evidence. Well, there exists some epsilon greater than zero, such that the chromatic number is the most 1 minus epsilon delta plus 1 plus epsilon omega. So it's a little bit away from the delta plus 1 in towards the omega. Some bit. So an alternate way to say this, which maybe is nicer, if you like the saved gap, is saying saved is at least epsilon of the it's some fraction of the gap. We can save, we can't save half, but we can save some fraction. And the King and his student Reed, uh, Reed and his student King proved in 2012, they, they gave a shorter proof, which I'll talk about, and they actually computed epsilon, uh, and they found it to be about 1 over 320e to the 6th, at least for, for large delta. For small delta, we don't uh, particularly care. And, but this is quite small. It's about 1 over, it's not very, very small, but it's still 1 over 130,000, where the conjecture is that epsilon equals a half suffices. But at least this is some progress. And so today I want to talk about, so this is motivated from this very kind of natural conjecture, what more can we say? Well, we can't prove the conjecture, but we can ask further questions. So I, here's three questions that I think are very pretty. One, can we improve the epsilon? Can we get bigger than 1 over 130,000 to something much more reasonable. Two, if you know about list coloring, can we generalize Reed's results into the world of list coloring or more general forms of coloring? And then three, so why maximum degree? So if you know about um, MAD, there's this concept called maximum average degree. So in coloring, I mean, we could try to replace maximum degree by average degree, but this is a bad idea in coloring because I could just take a clique and stick a lot of little isolated vertices, and this will have low average degree, but I need a lot of colors for the clique. So the correct notion of average degree in coloring is what's called the maximum average degree, which is you impose, you take the uh, maximum overall subgraphs of the average degree. So if I, if I say the maximum average degree is bounded, could, it, could we actually get some reed type results in that context instead of using maximum degree? So this is the natural analog. So are there any questions about these questions? If you have any questions, stop me. But let me answer the questions. So yes. So yes, we can improve epsilon. So this is what I'm going to talk about more in Fargo. But I'll highlight a little bit of what we do. So for large delta, we prove that epsilon uh, 25th suffices. So that seems a much more reasonable bound. And with a little more work, we think we can get like a 20th. So now we're more in the realm of we're figuring out how, where the, the obstacles are to getting the half. And we can generalize Reed's result to list coloring as long as the gap is, is actually a, a linear, say, in delta. So it could be 0.01 or 0.01, but as long as kind of the old clique number is not very, very close to the maximum degree. And we can also do the same to replace the max degree by max average degree. Well, here you would look at, instead of gap, what I call the mad gap, the difference between mad and omega. And we can do it as long as that is linear in mad, so kind of the analog of this condition for maximum average degree. So I'm not going to, I'll, I'll get to these later in the talk, but I want to go back now and talk about Reed's proof. So show you some of the proof techniques and what goes into this. So here's uh, an overview of the short proof of Reed's result by King and Reed. And the main idea is a very nice proof. It breaks it into three cases. So there are, and they're really just different ideas and techniques. So one is somewhat topological, uh, one is structural, and one is probabilistic. So it's a very interesting, it's a short proof. It's maybe five to ten pages. So case one, if the clique number is big, at least two-thirds delta, the idea here is that you can find an independent set that hits every maximum clique, 
and kind of use induction. I'll show you how this works in a second. But somehow, there's some nice inductive argument for that. So this means you'll keep applying case one, if you're thinking of it as an algorithm, and then you get down to mega is the most two-thirds. And now we ask a different question. We ask, is there a vertex where the neighborhood is very dense? What does very dense mean? Say, 99.9% .9 of the edges are there, somehow. There's lots and lots of edges in the neighborhood. And what we can show there is, well, it's really, really dense, but yet the clique number is very small. It's two-thirds. What you can show, then, is actually the neighborhood has to have what's called a large anti-matching. So matching is a complement. There's lots of pa this pairs of non-adjacent edges. And this is useful because basically it means we can delete that vertex and proceed by induction. That it's not a, a critical graph, if you know what that means. And the last idea, so, you, so algorithmically you keep kind of doing this, getting rid of the dense vertices, and it leaves you in the last case, which is, you know, clique number is small, and that every neighborhood is somewhat sparse. And the idea there is that you probabilistically color. So kind of if you color the vertices at random, then you can somewhat finish the coloring, and it will work. So let, I'll explore these in a second, but I just wanted to outline kind of how the proof will go. It's a very nice proof. So case one, the large clique number. Really, all that you need is the following theorem from King, whose proof is, is a bit involved, but is, is not um, that technical. And the idea is, so the main point is if you have this clique number be at least two-thirds delta, what tends to happen is that the cliques group themselves. Because if you have two cliques that intersect, then this, that means that they actually have to intersect a lot, because it only has delta neighbors. And what that means is all the cliques kind of form into kind of classes of ones that intersect, and from each of these you can pick a representative in such a way that they're independent. So you can get an independent set hitting every maximum clique. Why is that good? Well, let's just make it maximum, right? So take the independent set and just keep adding vertices until it's a maximum independent set, and now what? Well, if you delete this maximum independent set, what has happened? Well, I claim the max degree goes down by one, because what happens here is everybody has a neighbor in the independent set. Right? Because it's maximum. If, they, if somebody didn't have any neighbor, you just add. The clique number, by the way, has also gone down by one, because we hit all the maximum cliques. What about the chromatic number? Well, you only need one so if you could color it inductively, you only need one more color because you just give that independent set a color. What does this mean? I mean, it just means that that formula for Reed's conjecture, this formula, for any epsilon, it just works. If this goes down by one and this goes down by one, and that goes, it just all goes inductively. So that's the idea for large clique number. What about small clique number and having a dense neighborhood? Well, I need to give you two definitions. So one you probably know is a k-critical graph. So for coloring, since it's a monotone property, it makes sense to look at kind of the minimal k-colorable graphs. So the definition is it's not k minus one colorable, but every proper subgraph is. If you delete an edge or vertex, now you can k minus one color. These are the graphs of interest in coloring. And one other definition, which you probably don't know, will say a graph is sigma sparse if for every vertex, the neighborhood has the most one minus sigma of, say, delta choose two edges. So this is, so being dense is saying that you're, like, there's, if there's a vertex with this dense neighborhood more than this, you wouldn't be sigma sparse. So here's kind of the question for this case is, what is the maximum sigma of, let's say, as a function of gap and save, such that if you're delta minus saved critical, you can't save that many, but you have that gap, of gap, then you're sigma sparse. And the claim is, that this is actually, that there is actually such a sigma, that in that it's linear, or, or at least it's, some, it's something. And what's the idea? So I'll, I'll explain, I'll show you our theorem later, because there's different theorems. But this is a question that Reed addressed and others have, and I want to suggest that this is of an independent interest. I mean, I don't want, it doesn't have to be in the proof, just of independent interest. If I tell you you're this critical and you have this gap, can you show that it has to be sigma sparse for some sigma? And the key idea that we know is you can use anti-matching. In particular, here's a really easy proposition. Every graph, H, has an anti-matching M of size at least the number of vertices minus the clique number over 2. Why is that true? Well, 
okay, if it's a if it's a whole graph's a clique, then it's just saying where well, you have no anti-matching. That's true. But what happens if you're not a clique? So there is a, a missing edge. So you just remove that missing edge, then those two vertices, and the vertices go down by two. Clique number hasn't changed, but you're dividing by two. You find an anti-matching by induction, and you add the missing edge. So this is trivial. But how can we use that? The idea is if you can find an anti-matching in the neighborhood, and the neighborhood is dense, then somehow, the, so if here's our vertex V and here's a neighborhood, we're going to color the rest of the graph minus, you know, take out this matching, color the rest by criticality. Since you know it's a critical graph, you've deleted some vertices, you get a coloring, and then we're going to extend it. So let me redraw this picture over here, and I'll show you how this looks. So here's V, here's the neighborhood of V. And let's say, I think I drew it in such a way that they all have, say, a neighbor going out. Okay, and then we had this, it's basically K6, but minus an anti-match. Okay, so what good is this? Well, currently they all have, say, degree, what did I draw here? So they all have degree 6, right? So maybe, let's say, we're trying to uh, 5 list color this, so 5 color this graph, right? So now, so let's say we're trying to 5 color, and I delete N of V and get some color. So let's say this is 1, and this is 2, and 3, and 2, and 4, and 5, and I don't know, 2. What does that mean here? It, it becomes a list coloring problem. So it's suggesting that this, vertice, this vertex kid would be happy if it got 3, 4, or 5. Right? This one would be happy if it had 2, 4, or 5. Nobody can get 1 because they're all adjacent to V. But this would be 3, 4, 5. 3, 4, 5, this one would be 3, 2, 3, 4, and the last one I made a 4, so 2, 3, 5. So why is that good? Well, this anti-matching is quite powerful. Why? So let's look at two of them. So look at the top two. If, they, if these lists have a color in common, let's just color them with that color. Right, so for here, let's color them both 4. Now, what does that mean? It means I can't color anybody else 4, so let's kill 4 from these lists. Let's maybe even, maybe it was there, that's fine. But now proceed to the next edge. For the next edge, again, do they have a color in common or not? Right? So I want to say, if they, if they do, then go ahead and color that color. Kill the 3. And then you ask, do these have a color in common? And sure enough, they do. And what turns out, so there's a little bit hard to see. So, of course, if they keep having colors in common, then I only need basically the number uh, of vertices of one side of this anti match. You might wonder what happens when they don't, but the trick is when they don't have a color in common, then the idea is we can, we'd like to find such a pair so that they, they don't appear in, in like twice in any of these neighborhoods. Can you do that? I'm not going to go into the details, but yes, if you know Hall's theory. It's just an application of Hall's theory. So this is the main part for trying, and the anti-matchings are good. As for the sparse neighborhoods, it's, this is a different question now. So I told you, I'm telling you somehow that the graph is sigma sparse, and we ask what's the maximum epsilon of sigma, such that every graph that's sigma sparse is 1 minus epsilon delta colorable, that, i.e. that the saved is at least epsilon delta. So if I tell you a sparsity, can you tell me how much to save? And it's not clear that, I mean, this is, has, is a thing or that it's even linear in, in sigma. It will be. But let me explain the idea before I state the result. The main idea is this random procedure. So it's a probabilistic proof. I'm going to employ a, a very wasteful kind of naive coloring procedure. It goes like this. Color each vertex V with a random color. So, you know, you're coloring 1 to K. Color it at random. Well, that's stupid because it's not going to be a proper coloring. There are going to be vertices that are adjacent that have the same color. Well, all we do is uncolor any vertex that receives the same color as a neighbor. Right? So anybody who is in a conflict, just get rid of their color. And now what I'm going to do is somewhat strange. I claim that there are vertices that will retain their color. And now my plan is to complete the, the, the coloring, so color the rest of the vertices greedily. 
So pick an ordering, take a vertex color different from its neighbors, and do this. Does it work? Yes. And the idea is that every vertex will have many repeated colors in its neighbor. So what do I mean? One, a vertex will tend to retain its color. If you know uh, balls and bins or something, I mean, it's not likely that everybody in your neighborhood gets these different colors. They're going to group. And which means that there's a, like a one over each chance that you'll tend to retain that color. Why is that just good? Well, so every vertex, its neighbors will tend to do this. But you promise me it's sparse. There are lots of these non-adjacent pairs of vertices, and so it's likely that those, that those pairs will end up see, getting the same color. So it's, what happens is a vertex, I mean, for the same reasons I was saying before, tends to see lots of, like, its neighbors clump. Its ones that are colored also tend to clump. And so this is good because it means now the degrees of the vertices are smaller, but the, how many colors they've kind of killed from the list is, is not so bad. So that's the, that's the main idea. But now, uh, so I'll explain more of these in the results, but let me, let me answer part three in, in the meanwhile about list coloring while I do this. So just a reminder what list coloring is. So list assignment L, so you're going to give an assignment of list L of V to vertices of G. So the idea is I want to generalize coloring, so instead of everybody wanting to be colored 1 to K, now I want everybody to have their own list of possible colors. And we'll call it a k-list assignment if the list is size at least k for it. So this is a strict generalization of, of coloring. Instead of 1 to k, you just have everybody has k colors they want to be colored with. And we'll call it l-coloring. It's just a coloring where everybody gets assigned to their list. So still I want the adjacent vertices don't get the same color, but now I want you to be colored from the list. And the list chromatic number, or choice number, chi lg, is the minimum k such that g has an l-coloring for every k-list. Okay, and so in this context, it also makes sense to talk about saved of L, like delta plus one minus chi. And so now the question we're interested in is kind of is saved L still linear in this gap of G? Can I still save a fraction of the gap if you go to list coloring? And I want to now remind you of the proof outline of, of Reed and King, and you can ask, do any of these things work? And there's a big red flag here. Case one is a complete fail. Because our plan was to find an independent set hitting the maximum cliques, remove it, go by induction, and then extend the coloring back by giving everybody in this independent set the same color. And when you move into the world of list coloring where vertices have different lists, I mean, it doesn't matter if they're independent. They, their lists might be different. They might not be able to agree on a color, and so you can't extend it back. So we're definitely going to have to do something different in this case. What we're going to do is we're just going to ignore the case. What about case two and three? I mean, maybe. This probably, uh, so sorry, these are flipped. But this idea, the matching one, I mean, I kind of was doing this coloring anyway, so maybe it's not surprising that will work. This idea about the probabilistically, I mean, we could still try to color it random from the list, so it, maybe it would work. And the answer is yes, these things work. So let me go over the dense case again. So the thing, I mean, I could do this out, but actually there's a very well-known conjecture of OBA that was recently solved in 2012 that tells you that this actually works. Here's the, here's the conjecture, and now it's a theorem. So if the number of vertices is at most 2 chi plus 1, what's that saying? So if the chromatic number of a graph is at least half of the number of vertices, it turns out that the chromatic number is actually equal to this list chromatic number. So if you can color in normal color, and you can also color from this. Why is that good for the anti-matching? Well, what's the chromatic number of an anti-matching? It's basically n over 2, right? Because you color these different, these different, these different. And so now, what, what, so here I was kind of using all theorem and stuff, but I could just invoke Oba's conjecture and say, I know the chromatic number is n over 2, ergo the list chromatic number is n over 2 by Oba's conjecture. So as long as those lists are, are this, so here, I mean, I had list of size 3, that's 6 over 2, so I could just invoke OBAs and say we're done. And that's the trick. Um, so, but instead of critical graphs, we have to talk about list critical, if you want to do list coloring. There's the definition. And here's our main lemma. So I was asking, what is this uh, sigma? So maybe I, I put alpha, but I should put sigma. So if G is K list critical, where K is this delta minus saved, we were asking, can you force a certain sparsity? 
And the answer is yes, I can force a, a sparsity, which is the gap squared over 4 minus gap times state. And that actually has a very slick one-page proof. I'm not going to do it for you. Uh, but this is somehow, I mean, so unfortunately it's not linear in the gap, it's quadratic. So if the gap is really small, this is not very good. But as long as you promise me the gap is somewhat linear, and this is why we get these linear constraints for, for both the, the MAD and the list coloring, because I don't know how to make this a linear function. But okay, that's nice that we can do this. What about in the sparse neighborhoods? Actually, everything works there. <laughs> Remark, it's a homework exercise in Will Lloyd and Reed's uh, coloring book mm -hmm. to modify this sparse neighborhood lemma to work for list coloring. I mean, you just do it. However, I should also point out, so there have been new improvements um, to their, this sparsity lemma. And there's two kind of ideas to this coloring procedure. One, so it's a bit wasteful to uncolor all the pairs of vertices, right? If two vertices are in a conflict, we uncolored both of them. That seems a little bit wasteful. How could you do this better? Well, here's a very easy trick that does it for you. Before you color, take every edge and direct it at random, one way or the other, heads or tails. And now what you'll do is you'll only uncolor V if it's directed towards a conflicting neighbor. So you're kind of bra you're breaking the conflicts and randomly first. You're going to say, if you're going to get into a conflict, it'll be you who uncolors. So this helps. And there's, it turns out if you kind of do this, they, they originally did it somewhat sloppily. But if you count the expected number of repeated colors more efficiently, you can get this really nice lemma from Bjorn and Yost in 2015, which says that saved is basically 0.18 times the sparsity, minus some little error term, 0.07 alpha to 3 apps times delta g. So you can save. Uh, yeah, some linear fraction, and the fraction is quite high, it's 0.18. The upper bound for what's possible, we know 0.75 would not work. Uh, we don't know, maybe even point, there'd be, maybe the upper bound could be 0.5 as well. We're not really uh, sure of the upper bounds, but this, this, the original bound was something like 0.01, so this was a, a big improvement. And let me tell you, so once we saw this paper, we really liked it, and we wondered, could we do better? And the answer is actually, Yes. So actually, we realize you can even do this better. And the trick is, which has been known in coloring for a while, is something called um, kind of the nibble method. So what do we do? We colored vertices at random. They saw many repeated colors. And then what was our last step? We colored greedily. Why? Why did you color greedily? You have this really nice, awesome, random coloring procedure. Like, you should do that again. Right? So you should color more of the vertices at random, uncolor them. And then what? Color greedily? No, you keep going. You keep iterating your procedure again and again until eventually you can finish with, like, you say, okay, stop, do greedy. And if you do this, uh, you can get up to 0.3 alpha. So you get uh, some 60% uh, improvement. So this is nice. Now, I mean, of course, this is easy to say, but there are some technicalities as to why does this really work. So this is the things we didn't even believe could be true, but what turns out to be the idea is that um, the th main thing you have to check when you iterate, besides somehow the list working, all the degrees being the same, the main thing is why should the graph still be sparse? Right? So the whole point of this lemma is to say I have some sparsity, and now I can color. But if I color these vertices at random, I mean I have some subgraph left over, why is that subgraph still sparse in its neighborhoods? I mean maybe there's some vertex that's now as neighborhoods a clique, and this would be bad. Well, so the trick to realize is since it's essentially a random procedure, that what's left over is what we call a quasi-random subgraph. It basically looks like a random subgraph. Why is that good? Because in those quasi-random subgraphs, the actually the gaps, because we want it in terms of the gap. I'm going to have gap over 4, 5 thirds plus gap. Well, we know the gap's at least a third. So put in a third here and here, you get a third, you get four, you get two, you get one. It's the simplest. Okay, so let me tell you some other nice things in the time I have left. So here's a nice one if uh, you like applications. So the strong chromatic index. The strong chromatic index of a graph is the chromatic number of the square of its line graph. So you know the line graph from coloring edges? So you take the square of a graph, so I'm going to look at edges that are distance 2, and I want to color these. So I want edges that are at distance at most 2 to be different colors. And there's an easy upper bound because you know that actually how many 
what's the maximum degree of this graph is the most two delta squared. Because if you take an edge, if you take an edge, you have delta neighbors here. They can have up to delta squared neighbors, like delta squared edges here. And then same over on the other side. There's delta edges, there's delta squared edges. So you have two delta squared edges at distance two. But the question is, could you do better? Well, there's a conjecture of Erdos and Nesitril from 85 that you can do 1.25 delta squared. This is a nice old conjecture. And it's tight uh, for a blown up five cycle where actually we blow it up with independent sets. Because in this graph, all of the edges are distance at most two. If you check, so it's a clique. And if you do it out, it turns out it's 1.25 of the max degree. So it's tight. It's actually not even known if the clique number of these graphs is 1.25. The best known is 1.5 from last year. But this was uh, actually an original application of uh, Reed and Malloy with this sparsity lemma. And the main trick is they can actually prove that squares of line graphs are sigma sparse. So for what sigma, it turns out for a 36. So they prove that somehow, I mean, if you look at these pictures, somehow that a number of edges in your neighborhood that are also distance two from each other is not, it's not like a clique. And when you just do that with their wasteful coloring procedure, they get some very slight improvement from two. They get 1.9987. But it was the first found away from two. And actually, so that Brun and Yost result I told you about, their improved wasteful coloring procedure was actually meant to improve this bound. Why? They also simultaneously improved the sparsity to three quarters. And then they applied their improved procedure, and they could dramatically improve 1.9987 to 1.93. So getting all the way there. So when we saw this, this has kind of got us interested. And, well, this is actually tight. There are graphs where you can have this sparsity. But it turns out somehow not critical graphs. So if you impose a max high degree, high min degree condition, you can lower it to 0.63. We applied our extra iterative procedure, which had a 60% improvement, and we can improve it to 1.82 about. So I don't know, we can't prove the full conjecture probably this way, but it seemed like this, this was kind of a nice application. So anyway, that, that concludes what I wanted to say about that stuff. But let me tell you some, some more interesting things. In particular, I, I've been lying. Right, about this whole, uh, this whole random procedure, there's a real, this, especially this iterative procedure, there's a huge technicality. So I told you one technicality is the sparsity, but there's actually a second, even worse technicality, is can we really force the degrees of uncolored vertices to be roughly equal? So when you do this once, can you really force, like the key I was going to say is you're going to apply it inductively, so you want the degrees to be roughly equal, like some max degree. And this is not really true, because what if there's a vertex whose list we're doing list coloring, is mostly disjoint from its neighbors. Surely it will tend to retain its color more, and hence its neighbors will tend to have fewer uncolored neighbors. Right? So in list coloring, if the lists become disjoint, weird things can happen. And so my question is, maybe can we somehow force the list to interact? That is, can we force all the lists to conflict so that every vertex retains every color with the same probability? And you can, technically you can do this with something called equalizing coin flips, but we found a nice solution, which is an idea uh, that Zdenek Dvorak and I had last year, which was called correspondence coloring. So let me tell you about this, because it's for me. So let L be a k-list assignment for G. And let's look at two vertices, U and V. Let's suppose you're doing three lists of size 3, so let's say the list is 1, 2, 3, and 2, 3, 4. Then what is that list doing? The list is saying, okay, you can't color both of these two. This is what the edge is doing. You can't color both of these three. So let me put in kind of a, a matching between two and two and three and three. Once you view it in this light, what's to stop you from putting in more matching edges? In particular, we could say, I don't want this vertex to be one when this vertex is four. So we're going to put in a, a conflict. And this is a notion we call correspondence coloring, and we call this a correspondence assignment. So on every edge, we're going to put a matching from the list to the other list, and it'll have a correspondence coloring if it's a coloring, and the two on every edge, the two don't have a conflicting edge in this match. And this is actually a, a generalization of list coloring, because I said you can do it with a list. But actually, once you do it this way, you don't actually need list anymore, because you could just permute everything to be one up to k. Like, the, list, the names of the colors don't matter at all. So you might as well say one up to k. 
So you can define the correspondence chromatic number, which is the minimum k for all k correspondence assignments that you get a coloring. And obviously it's at least the list chromatic number because it's a generalization. And they can differ. So even in a simple example, C4 has chromatic number and choice number 2. But actually its correspondence number is 3. Here, why? Pick these lists with these matchings. And what happens? So what happens in, on this edge? You're saying you can't be 2 and 1, you can't be 1 and 2. What does that mean? It forces them to be the same color. That can either both be 1 or both be 2. So why don't we just collapse them into a vertex? And what happens? You get a triangle with a normal matching, and you can't two-color a triangle. So they can be wildly different, and I won't show you those examples. But we can still ask all these questions. You can set saved c to be delta minus chi of c. And you can ask, and it turns out all of our lemmas can be done uh, basically in correspondence color. That the, this um, probabilistic procedure, it didn't really matter what they were called. They just wanted that they conflict. So we can do that one. And the idea to make, uh, now that, why is this better than list coloring? Because we said the problem with lists is they become disjoint, that they, they, they don't force things. Well, here, just forget about the list. We have these matchings. Just make all of the matchings perfect. So just add, add conflicts, so that way everybody will retain it with the same probability. And in this way, we can also show the chromatic, correspondence chromatic number for the square of the line graph is 1.82. So that's over. Yep. So it strikes me that I, I can talk about list coloring for a hypergraph pretty easily. And, but that simplification you say, where you can just relabel the vertices, doesn't really work for a, a hypergraph list. So honestly, I hadn't actually thought design. about doing correspondence coloring for hypergraphs. Mm. Well, most people don't do list coloring for hypergraphs anyway. Yeah, I, I mean, you have to get, you have to debate what uh, the depth, the generalization of the conflict is, right? Mm -hmm. Is it an edge? Is it a hyper edge? It would strike me as the hyper edge. Probably a hyper edge, right? And so then. I think we could try to do it. Uh, I think once you do it with hyper edges, then probably it doesn't matter what you call it. But I think there's a, a I think it might, actually, because just because of the dependence conflict. Um, you know, if you have two edges that intersect in the same way, then the... the we, we would have to debate whether, I mean, I think, I think I'd want them to be some hyper matching of edges, of hyper edges. Yes. Like totally hyper. disjoint, and then maybe it wouldn't matter. But this is good, this, I'll, we, we can talk about this. But I haven't thought about it. Maybe I don't know if it'd be a useful concept. But yeah. And somehow this has been a really nice. We can introduce this to prove things about like Steinberg conjecture and list coloring there. And then now it just seems like it's just a like all this work has really been doing. I mean, sometimes they differ. So for example, let me actually tell you. I mean, for correspondence coloring, I said our probabilistic things work, but I, I actually kind of lied because I didn't tell you this part worked. And why? I mean, so it could be true that there is some epsilon that you can save that much of the gap for correspondence. And the proof almost goes through. You can, uh, you can sorry, so case three. You can do the uh, probabilistic part, but the main thing is, does this OBA conjecture hold? Like, is it true that if you, is the chromatic number equal, this chromatic number equal to correspondence? Well, no, because C4 is K4 minus a anti-matching. And there it's two and two and three, so it could just be very false. And so you can ask, can we save anything for an anti-matching for correspondence coloring? And the answer is yes. So it turns out we can't save a half, but we can actually, I can prove you can save something like one minus epsilon, like one point, like it's 0.999 maybe. You can save some small fraction. I don't know what the, it could be up to three quarters maybe, something like that. And somehow the proof sketch is nice, because it's, it divides, you divide it into two cases for the anti-matching. Somehow, almost all of the colors are what I call consistent on almost all triangles. So in coloring, if you go around a triangle, you get back to it yourself when you, when you look at these conflicts. So somehow, if that happens, it's basically like you're in coloring, ordinary coloring world. And then you can, the idea is you can color all the anti-match pairs with the same color. It's like it, you can color them with a set of colors where most everybody agrees that that's the same color for all intents and purposes. And the other idea is if this doesn't happen, then somehow there's lots of disagreement about what colors mean. And this is very good for random coloring. Because it means that somehow, to me, I see that these neighbors have the same color, but they're disagreeing. that that's, They don't think that's a conflict for them. So when I color it random, they'll end up getting that color, and it'll be repeated for me. But they can do that because it's not a conflict for them. And somehow you do this idea, and you can get 
everything to like you can at least get some savings for correspondence color. And in my last uh, minutes, let me just tell you uh, some more things, if, you, if you'll abide me. Uh, so where did, we, where did this all start? Well, we can also prove local versions of Reed's conjecture. What do I mean by this? So it's a little weird, but could we allow the degree sizes to vary, right? Like, does that, does that really matter? Well, that's easy, I mean, unless you also let the list sizes vary, right? I mean, that would just be saying I could let the degrees be, like, bigger. Well, that doesn't mean anything, so if you have to let the list sizes vary. So what we do is we define a saved L where you take the difference between the degree and the list that you want at that. So you want to save this many colors from their degree, and you kind of take the maximum over everybody. And now the question is, can you actually, so we define some local saving number, which is, can you actually always save that number locally? And in this case, in uh, probabilistic coloring, it turns out the number of colors you save is a local property. So you can basically get this lemma before in some local version. And also, you can ask, what about the gap? between degree and clique number, could you let that be local? And it's a very natural notion. You define the local clique number of a vertex to be the clique of its neighborhood. And you can define the gap in a vertex to be its degree minus the local clique number. And therefore, you can define a local gap number taking the minimum over all vertices. And actually, you realize that this proof works in local form. Assuming that there's a slight technicality, you have to assume that the minimum degree is somehow on the same order as the uh, a maximum degree. Because if somehow if you have really small degrees, this argument's going to break down. But basically, under these assumptions, for the minimum degree, you can get that the local save is some constant times the local gap. So that's nice. Why is that useful? It lets us answer the max average degree question. So I told you max average degree is the max of average degrees of the subgraphs. And if the maximum average degree is, say, less than k minus 1, this means there's a vertex of degree k minus 2 in the graph, so if you do it inductively, you get k minus 2 degeneracy, so you can color the graph with k minus 1 colors, so less than k. So basically, it turns out, the, I told you chi is the most delta thing, that is basically true for max average degree, up to maybe rounding up into plus 1 or something. And what was known, well, Kostanchkin and Stiebitz proved things like, if omega is fixed, that in max average degree is k, like basically 2k, chromatic number is the most k. What am I saying here? That the chromatic, if, the, if omega is fixed, chromatic number is basically half of max average degree. This is an old theorem. Well, we could make a conjecture then, right? We can conjecture Reed's version, right? That the chromatic number is the most some bit away from the mad and towards the omega. In particular, it could even be true that it's true for half, like in Reed's conjecture. And so let's define mad gap. So we'd be saying we can save some fraction of this mad gap. Okay? Well, this is actually related to the following concept. What's the minimum number of edges in a k-critical graph? There's a trivial lower bound, because you know min degree k minus 1. And there was a big result from a couple years ago that you, oh, this is supposed to be 1 over, that you can basically get a little bit better than this. But this was some 50-year-old conjecture on what's the minimum number. And it's been found. But you can ask about excluding, you can ask to do better. So this was a question I asked before, like, could we do better than this by excluding cliques? And you can't be, I mean, so the, you can't do better because it's actually tight, but maybe you could do better if you exclude cliques. So, in, like, say, by excluding some subgraphs or cliques, and, well, what, you could try to exclude kk minus 1, but that fails. So if you take k being 4, here's k4, this is a critical graph, and the bound you get from Kostacha Yancey is 5 thirds, and what you, but you can build an example where you take this and you replace it by a diamond and you replace that by another diamond, and another diamond, and you can kill all of the triangles without actually killing the, the five-thirds. So, I mean, okay, I lied, because there's two triangles on both ends, but if you replace them by some kk minus one free k-critical graph on both ends, so you can, you can do this. But it turns out for kk minus two, it's true. So we can prove, we improve their thing well, I conjectured that you could do it for all k, but you can make some small epsilon improvement asymptotically. And we've proven this for 4, where, well, not k2 free is stupid, so we prove it for girth 5, which is somehow the right analog, for 5 and for 6 and for large k. And it led me, so actually, this is my backstory. I wanted to say that 
this is actually how he, I got interested in all of the questions in this talk. I started with this. I said, could we do it for k minus 2? And then I wondered, could you do better? In particular, this very general conjecture, for every alpha, could, you, could there be an epsilon? So if you assume that the clique number is somewhat smaller, that you can save actually some 1 plus epsilon times k minus 2. So not k minus 2 plus a little bit, but actually some multiplicative epsilon. And it turns out that's a theorem we have from last year with my student Chen, and the, we can even do it for list critical or correspondence critical. And the reason I want to sit so to the end my talk, this conjecture, this theorem, implies this theorem that you can save some epsilon of the math gap, because maximum average degree and the number of edges you can get a critical graph are basically the same concept. Because if you know that critical graphs don't have too many edges, maximum average degree says no subgraph has too many edges, so you can't contain such a critical graph which has lots of edges. So you can actually do this. And I have some proof, but we'll skip that. And thank you. Some questions for Luke? Very good one during the talk about hypergraphs. Okay, let's thank Luke again.